The Tracker by Tom Brown Jr. Chapter 1, Part 2 <clears throat> I was fascinated with nature even before Stalking Wolf taught me to track, but my nature watching was limited by the necessity of sitting and waiting for a long time in a place where we had hoped something might happen. Stalking Wolf gave me the tools to track the mystery to its source. He taught me how to teach myself. I have been using the tools he gave me ever since. Stalking Wolf was an Apache tracker. He had come to New Jersey to be near his, his son, who was stationed there. His grandson, Rick, was my best friend, and Stalking Wolf taught both of us how we could teach ourselves to track, to stalk, to live in the woods, and to survive there. He gave us the questions that would lead us to answers, but he had never told us an answer. He taught me how to see and to hear, to walk and to remain silent. He taught me how to be patient and resourceful, how to know and how to understand. He taught me to see invisible things from the trail that all action leaves around itself. He taught me how to teach myself the mystery of the track. <clears throat> Since Stalking Wolf began teaching me, I have worked every day of my life at learning more and more about nature and about tracking. What I have learned was not easily learned, but anyone willing to take the time could do it. Most of the fundamental principles of how to track are in this book, and anyone can learn them. Anyone willing to spend 20 years working diligently at it can learn the minute nuances of it as well. Stalking Wolf thought I had a gift for tracking. Anyone with a greater gift could probably learn the nuances in less time. After 20 years, I'm still finding things in tracks that I've never seen before, and I do not believe I am in any danger of running out of discoveries. School taught me how to read. Stalking Wolf taught me how to learn. I have been learning something every... <clears throat> I have been learning something every minute since. And there's no better way to unravel the mystery than to watch it move. But mysteries are by nature shy and secretive, and most often the closest you get to them is the traces left behind by movement and the disturbances left by action. I could not see the bird, but I could see the actions of the bird in the tra traces he left and in the disturbances made by his actions. I could see what was out of place since he'd come and gone, and seeds where they did not grow the tracks in the snow the snow itself dusted down where it would not have been naturally i could see the bird go through his routine almost as surely as if i had stood there watching him but a track is a temporary thing unless the mud goes suddenly hard and turns gradually to stone the tracks do not last they fade and as they dry the wind sweeps them relentlessly level to ease in which <clears throat> ease its way across the ground. Tracks exist at the interface where the sky drags along the surface of the earth. They exist for a relatively brief time in a narrow level near the surface of the ground where the wind and the weather move across, changing the temperature and building information into the track. Wind pushes the tracks flat. Rain tries to wash them away. Nature conspires to steal even the traces of passage. <clears throat> Most tracks made in the world go underseen, or unseen, sorry. I try to follow everyone I can. <clears throat> Each trail is one of a kind. The same combination of weather, land, temperature, and creature are probably duplicated no more often than snowflakes. Oh, sorry there. The same interactions between so many variables probably never recur. Even within the easily identified habitual gait of a person, there are nuances made by the changing flux of emotion as he or she moved. The sheer variety of tracks is astounding. The amount that can be learned from them is irresistible. Either by gift or by curse, I have a compulsion to know more about nature. I can never get enough. Everything I learn makes me see how much more there is to know and how little time there is in a lifetime to learn it all. Stalking Wolf gave me the tools I needed to pursue my curiosity, and I have been sharpening these tools ever since. 
the vision of the world given me by Stalking Wolf has become a window into time. The more tracks I see, the clearer the picture of the animal becomes, until I see him moving as he moved a minute, an hour, a month before I came along. When the tracks stop, I can still see the animal, how it paused, how it rested as its body, where it put its paws. The animal is there before me, almost real enough to touch, fixed in time by the impression of its track. I see from the track the motion of his feet, the motion of his body. I see the animal itself lying down, the mystery of its coming and going. <coughs> Nothing makes this picture more vivid to me than a skull. When Rick and I found a skull, it kept us busy for days. We cleaned it, assembled it, drew it, and sketched the animal in around it. When we found a complete skeleton, scattered as it often was for hundreds of year yards by the wild dogs, we were busy for weeks. Short of the animal itself making the tracks, nothing pleased us more than a skull. A skull is the ultimate track a creature leaves. When everything else has been unshaped by time, when every scratch and print is gone, the skull remains. When I find a skull, it's as if I'm standing within touch of the second greatest mystery in the universe. The mystery of where creatures go when they leave and its greatest mystery of all. The pattern of life itself. The visible design of the invisible that we call nature. The place where you lose a trail is not necessarily the place where it ends. A lost trail always extends beyond the evidence. And even the trails we find are only in fragments of the trails that lie beyond our comprehension. When the bird <clears throat> left my feeder and flew, I could trail him on my inference, but his trail went on after I lost it. And when I believe it goes beyond the skull as well, although I have no idea what it's like or how to follow it, Skulls simply mark the point of departure and the direction of flight, like the brush of a bird's wing in the snow. I found my first skull in a swamp a mile or so from my house in Beechwood, right off the Toms River, in a place that is marina in a parking lot now. It was only a pile of broken bones when I found it, but I took it home and fit the pieces together until I had the answer to what it was. But every answer brings with it the inevitable question. What has this thing got to do with everything else? There is only one answer to that question, but you have to find it out for yourself a little at a time before over a lot of years. The question of what the bones made led me to the question of what kind of skull it was, and the answer to that question led me to the question of how the animal had lived and where he'd fit into the larger pattern of life. I'm going to move the mic sack over. <coughs> I am still following the trail of questions that I picked up where I made that little pile of bones into a skull. This book is its story of that trail as I have been come down to it so far. It begins when I was seven. The pine trees came all the way down to the river then. The houses in even the most settled part of the pine barrens were few and far between. Outside Tom's River, they were scattered in little clumps or strung out in at erratic intervals along roads made by hard-packed sand and gravel. There were not enough people in the entire par Pine Barrens to make a decent-sized city. From Osbury Park to Trenton, from Camden to Cape May, larger than Grand Canyon National Park, stretched the wilderness of pine pitch and underbrush cut by an endless tangle of sand roads without names or numbers. Along the roads, a few hundred native pine pineys went back and forth between villages like Hogwallow and New Egypt, and old cars and trucks dying slowly from the assaults of foot-high bumps and ankle-deep potholes. But they rarely got out of their cars. A hundred yards off any sand road, there was probably still a place where no human being had stood in a century. But it's dangerous to go and look. The road sinks half a foot below the brush that packs the space between 30-foot pines, and a traveler goes 10 yards into the woods, cannot look back and find the road again. About twice a year, someone wanders into the pine barrens and dies trying to find their way out. 
Even the Pineys, whose family have lived in the Pine Barrens for more generations than any of them can remember, stick to the roads. I always went across the roads, following deer runs, making my own trails, running down any track I found. I have loved the woods as long as I can remember, and I lived in them all my life. We lived in the fringes of the forest, just off the river, but my back door opened into the wilderness. To me, it was only my backyard. If my parents asked me where I was going, <laughs> I just told them, just camping in the backyard. I meant it, and it was true, but to me, the backyard f fanned out for hundreds and hundreds of square miles. I had to wander the Grand Tendons and go to California before I found the fence or the back fence. I rarely told my parents what went on in the woods, and much of this book would probably come as a surprise to them. But I knew how much they worried about me, and I was afraid that my adventure I told them about might have frightened them into keeping me closer home. Some of the things that happened to me would certainly have cost me my freedom if I had mentioned them, so I said nothing. The woods were my life, and still are. I could not risk losing them. There were trails to follow there, and mysteries to be tracked down. Some callings cannot be ignored. At first, I had only my curiosity and my golden book of nature to guide me. But all that changed one day, when I was walking along the river a short way down from my house. I was walking along the bank looking for fossils when I ran into a small, muscular, dark-haired boy doing the same thing. As far as I knew, I was the only one in New Jersey who had even the least interest in fossils or knew enough to go along the river bank looking for them. I asked him what he was doing and he said, looking for fossils. My heart started pounding. Finally, finally I had someone to talk to. Someone who could understand what I was saying and caring, cared about it. We sat down on a log at the edge of the river around 8 o'clock in the morning and began to talk about nature. By noon, we were colleagues. By three, we were friends. Eventually, we were to become brothers. There were places where our skills and knowledge overlapped, but more often than not, they complemented each other. Rick, small, muscular, slim, was a better runner and a better stalker than I was. He had a knack for stalking, and he moved far more quietly than I did, even allowing for the difference in size. But I had a passion for tracking, and I was better at that. There was rarely any competition between us, and we were inseparable during the whole period of my training by his grandfather. After we had talked through half the afternoon, Rick took me home with him to meet the man who would be my teacher and guide me for the next nine years. I was in awe of stalking well from the beginning. He was of medium height and lean, like his grandson Rick, but his features were classical Indian. There were centuries of dead civilization in his face, and his eyes seemed to be looking for things very far away that distracted him. He seemed to be watching some complex totality that absorbed most of his attention. Alright, I gotta stop here and continue on the next part. Thanks for listening.